Chapter Sixteen of The Lady of the Basement Flat by Mrs. George D. Horn Vasey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A glorious thing. The first day after taking possession of my flat, I paid a visit to a celebrated expert in theatrical makeup and paid for his help and advice it is not an easy thing for a young woman to transform herself into an old one and i have a weakness for doing a thing well when i set about it he was a delightful man i remember him with the liveliest appreciation i was nervous and embarrassed but in two minutes he put me at my ease from his manner you would have supposed that my errand was as ordinary and conventional as buying a postage stamp while his keenness his cleverness his professional zest were refreshing to behold he stared at and criticised my face with as much impersonality as if it had been a picture on the wall always look for the predominant factor the feature or features which give personality to the face in your case they are undoubtedly the eyebrows and the curve of the upper lip a few judicious touches to these will alter the whole expression to a surprising extent a few more lines will give age the wig and spectacles are the refugees of the amateur in themselves they can do little but with the touches i suggest and a deep-toned powder to darken the skin your disguise will be complete you shall see you shall see he motioned to a chair before a mirror and set to work explaining each detail as he went along it was marvellous to see how beneath the sweep of a tiny brush my youth and good looks faded and disappeared then he made me wash it all off and do the same thing for myself three times over the process was repeated before i passed to his satisfaction to my relief he laughed at the idea of the india-rubber pads and indeed they were no longer required but he gave me a small appliance which could be used when i especially desired to alter my voice then he sent me to a woman expert who designed a nice little pad to round my shoulders i can't say that it was exactly a hilarious afternoon and now a month has passed by for a whole month mary harding has resolutely ignored evelyn wastneys and devoted her time to the service of others i was just going to say her whole thought also but stopped short just in time the plain truth is that the ignoring of evelyn engrosses many thoughts she is a regular jack-in-the-box who is no sooner shut in than up bobs her head again wailing miserably i'm lonely i'm lonely i want to go home then mary the aunt snaps the lid more tightly than ever but through the chink a persistent whisper makes itself heard i'm lonely i'm lonely i i want someone to think of me the flat is comfortable enough and i am well served with bridget as housekeeper and a clean young orphan of seventeen to work under her and open the door the orphan was procured as much as a safety guard from myself as an assistant to bridget in case any one who knows me in my true role should by any possibility discover my hiding-place and appear suddenly at the door it is better to keep bridget in the background and as emily knows me only in the character of aunt i am necessarily kept up to the mark in the matter of disguise i wear elderly clothes tinted spectacles and a dowdy wig and with a few touches alter the shape of my upper lip that is all that is necessary for ordinary life the cheek pads are reserved for occasions of special need emily considers me a nice old lady and young in my ways she likewise confides to bridget that she shouldn't wonder if i'd been quite good-looking in my day why did i never marry was it a disappointment like in outdoor dress especially i look genuinely middle-aged 
young women get up in the tubes and offer me their seats volumes could say no more as regards my work i have discovered that in london it is as difficult to get to know one's neighbours as it is to avoid knowing them in the country in my rustic ignorance i had imagined that all the inhabitants of the mansions would be keenly interested in the advent of a new tenant and curious about her personality i imagined them talking together about me and saying have you seen the new lady in the basement what does she look like when shall you call but in reality no one cared a jot there has been another removal since i came and i overheard one or two comments in the hall bother these removals they make such a mess those tiresome bands block the way for my pram not one word of interest in the removal itself not one word of inquiry as to the newcomers so far as interest or sympathy went each little shut-in dwelling is as isolated as a lighthouse for the past few weeks i have been haunted by a vision of myself beating an ignominious retreat after having altogether failed in my mission to console myself i began a second course of red cross training to revive what i had learned two years before perhaps some day one of the tenants will be ill or have an accident which will give me a chance watching the stream of children coming in and out of the mansions i almost found it in my heart to wish that one of them would tumble down and break not his crown but just some minor innocent little bone so that his mother could behold how promptly and efficiently i could render first aid a month passed by four long lonely weeks not a line from charmion not a line from delphine not a line from the big blustering lover who had vowed never no never to give up the pursuit with one and all out of sight was apparently out of mind and i am the sort of woman who needs to be remembered and appreciated and who feels reduced to the lowest ebb when nobody takes any notice i wondered what charmion was doing i wondered how delphine was faring i wondered did he really care so much would he go on caring suppose i had cared too then another long lonely day came to an end and i crawled into bed and cried whatever my virtues may be i am afraid i am not strong-minded but at the end of a month hooray i started full tilt into a new and engrossing profession a profession which i may really claim to have invented and which offers a wide field for idle women it is healthy moreover and in its pursuit its followers can be of immense service to their overtaxed sisters the vocation is called pram pushing for penurious parents and it consists simply of taking charge of tommy or bobby or baby for his morning or afternoon promenade and thereby setting his mother free to take a much-needed rest the way it began was natural enough i smiled at a pretty baby in the hall and the baby smiled back at me and threw a ball at my feet i picked it up and gave it back to a worried-looking little mother who was endeavouring to arrange the wrapping in the perambulator with one hand while with the other she clutched firmly at the arm of an obstreperous person of three she smiled at me in wan acknowledgment and i said may i help and tucked in one side of the shawl two mornings later i met the same trio returning from their morning's walk a third time i picked the small boy out of a puddle and helped to wipe off the mud that broke the ice and the mother began to bow to me and to exchange a passing word she is a delicate creature and has the exhausted air of one whose life is all work and no play one day we walked the length of the block together and she told me that she had been married for four years had had three children and lost one that she kept only one maid and so had to take the children out herself it was tiring work pram pushing for four or five hours a day but they must have fresh air nowadays doctors insisted that children should never stay in even on wet days 
she smiled mirthlessly they are covered up and protected from damp it's different for the poor mothers she coughed as she spoke and then and there the great idea leapt into my head i did not disclose it she would probably have put me down for a baby snatcher at once but i made a point of meeting her on her daily outings and of ingratiating myself with the children and waited eagerly for an opportunity which came in the shape of an increasing cough and cold then i pounced why shouldn't i take the children out this afternoon and let you go home and rest you are not fit to push this heavy pram she gaped at me amazed and embarrassed you oh <coughs> i couldn't possibly why should you because i should love it i have nothing to do and the days seem so long i'd be very careful oh it's not that i'm sure you would and the children would love it they are so fond of you already but well i couldn't it is too much but i do thank you all the same it's sweet of you to have thought of it for the moment it was plainly tactless to urge her further so i just repeated well i mean it please send for me if you change your mind and retreated forthwith behold the reward of diplomacy that very evening mr manners the papa knocked at my door and requested to see miss harding i was reading comfortably sans wig and sans spectacles behind the locked door of my bedroom the little maid having been repeatedly instructed that all callers were to be shown into the drawing-room was no doubt elated to have an opportunity of turning precept into practice i arose hastily made myself look as elderly and discreet as possible and sallied forth to greet him it was the funniest interview he had brought down a copy of punch a week old with his wife's compliments in case i should like to see it that was the excuse the real reason was obviously to survey the extraordinary spinster of the basement flat and discover if she were quite mad or just innocently eccentric i could see him peering at me out of his tired worried eyes and if ever i worked hard to worm myself into a man's good graces i did it during the next half hour i pricked my ears listening for clues and when one came i played up to it with all my skill agreeing with him soothing him hanging on his words he looked almost as tired as his wife there were shiny patches on his coat his hair was turning white above the ears he had the look of a man driven beyond his strength i made him a cup of coffee good coffee over which he sighed appreciatively i told him i liked the smell of smoke i offered him the spectator in exchange for punch at the end of half an hour he was looking at me wistfully and saying in quite a natural boyish voice i say it was nailing good of you to offer to take out the kiddies to save my wife she was quite touched she does need a rest poor girl but of course don't say of course you cannot accept the only of course is to take me at my word mr manners may i say exactly what i think he looked startled and said please do memo i must try to remember that an impulsive manner is not suitable to grey hairs well it's just this if you won't allow me to help your wife to have a little rest now she will be obliged to take a longer one later on that cough needs care i know something about nursing and i'm sure that if she goes on as she is doing now she'll break down altogether i know it he said miserably i've been feeling the same myself that was why to-night when she told me i came down to see for yourself if i could be trusted i said laughing and what is your verdict mr manners do i look as if i would kidnap babies do i look as if i had strength enough to push a pram he glanced at my grey locks and said tactfully bobby could walk part of the time kensington is fortunately flat 
miss harding i i i'm very grateful it's most awfully good of you to worry about such perfect strangers if you will relieve my wife for a few days i shall be most awfully grateful so it was arranged i danced a jig of joy when i went back to my room and caught sight of my elderly reflection doing it in the glass and i laughed till i cried my work had begun the thin end of the wedge had wormed its way in now to push forward mrs manners has another malady besides her cough it's an obscure disease but i have diagnosed it as chronic inflammation of the conscience for four long years she has been kept incessantly at work looking after house and children and has been unable to have one undisturbed hour either by day or by night now when she gets the chance her conscience is horrified at the prospect the first time i took the children for their afternoon walk i found on my return that she had used the time to turn out a cupboard and looked more tired than ever the next day i sent the maid downstairs to settle the children in the perambulator when i produced a hot water bottle from under my coat and had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with her there and then mrs manners i am going to take you into your bedroom tuck you up under the quilt give you this hot water bottle to cuddle pull down the blinds and leave you to rest there till we come in she positively shook with horror oh miss harding i can't it is quite impossible all that time if you knew all i have to do there is another cupboard mrs manners if you think i am taking charge of the children out of consideration for your cupboards you are mistaken i am doing it so that you may rest a bargain is a bargain and you are not playing fair now are you coming or are you not she came not daring to refuse but protesting all the way well if i must for a little time for half an hour i couldn't possibly rest more than half an hour you've got to try if i'm on duty for two hours so are you don't dare to move from this bed till i give you leave it was pathetic to see her thin little face peering at me over the edge of the eiderdown quite dazed if you please at the idea of a two hours rest i felt as happy as a grig as i ran downstairs happier still when we re-entered the flat two hours later and not a sound came from behind that closed door i undressed the children and the maid tiptoed in with their tea with the air of a conspirator in a dark and stealthy plot not a sound out of her since you left poor thing first chance of a bit of peace and quietness she's had for many a long day well mary you and i are going to give her plenty more i said graciously and mary made me a slice of buttered toast on the spot to seal the partnership tea was over when the door opened and a sleepy flushed face peeped round the door to look at the clock when she saw the hands pointing to five she looked as guilty as if she had robbed the bank oh it's a glorious thing to be able to help other people it gives one a warm glowy feeling about the heart which comes in no other way these last days i have just lived for the moment when i could tuck that poor little woman in her cosy bed and the other moment when i saw her rested freshened face on rising even at the end of one week she looked a different creature and felt it too actually dear miss harding i begin to feel as if i i should like a new hat she said to me one day over tea do you know the feeling i think it is the best sign of convalescence a woman could have for months almost for years i have not cared what i wore something to cover my head that was all that was needed to be always tired deadly hopelessly tired takes the spirit out of one no one should go on being too tired it's very wrong to allow it she looked at me a long look affectionate grateful reproachfully amused my dear you live alone and you have two maids evidently excuse me you have a comfortable income my husband's business had been steadily falling off for the last two years it is not his fault he works like a horse no man could have done more but circumstances have been against him 
we keep one maid who washes bakes and cooks while i tend the babies make their clothes and my own knit and mend and patch and darn take the children out bathe them put them to bed attend to them through the night do the housekeeping by day and struggle over the bills when they are in bed bobby is three years and a half old and has bronchitis and measles baby is eleven months and cuts her teeth with croup between them came the little one who died and then you sit there and tell me i ought not to be tired i beg your pardon i'm sorry i spoke without thinking you are quite right i know nothing about it people who preach to others very often don't forgive me don't be so penitent it really is almost a relief to meet a woman who doesn't understand all my friends are in pretty much the same case as myself and they haven't got she stretched out her hand and timidly patted my arm my kind neighbour to help miss harding i think you must have been a fascinating girl oh i was i said warmly and then made haste to change the conversation what about that hat i'm quite a good amateur milliner look out your oddments and let me see what i can do end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain neighbours and real work the fame of me has gone abroad i have been observed taking the manners infants in and out and the result has been a simultaneous increase of interest and loss of prestige number twenty two like mrs manners pushes her own pram but there the resemblance ends she is a healthy full-blown young woman smartly and unsuitably attired in the very latest fashion of kensington high street she wears large artificial pearls round her neck and wafts a strong odour of lily-of-the-valley perfume never for the fraction of a second did it occur to me to offer to relieve her of any of her duties but she cast a pale blue eye at me and wove her own little schemes one afternoon as i was tucking the coverings round baby margaret's feet she came up to my side and said in an exceedingly casual manner oh good afternoon you are miss harding i was just wondering have you any engagement for the mornings i looked at her calmly and said i had several most householders had she jerked her head and said impatiently i didn't mean that you take mrs manners children out i see i might be glad of a little help myself it's such a bore pram pushing every day how much do you charge it is difficult to look haughty through blue spectacles and while i was trying it occurred to me that it was a waste of time it was a plain business question she did not mean to be insulting so i smiled instead rather feebly i confess and said i don't charge mrs manners is not well it is a pleasure to me to take charge of the children so that she may have a little rest she begged pardon hastily and with repetition staring the while with incredulous eyes quite evidently she considered me a benevolent lunatic and marked me down as a useful prey i might not be willing to push her pram but the very next evening a small servant knocked at the door with mrs lorimer's compliments and could miss harding lend her a fresh egg her name is lorimer and the children are called claudia maureen and eric and look it a fortnight has passed since that encounter and the tale of her indebtedness to me is now as follows one egg a cup of sugar two lemons a bit of butter as we're run out a box of matches and a candle one scuttle of nice cobbles please we have only slack left three stamps just a pinch or two of tea as we forgot to order over sunday 
bridget opines that it will go from bad to worse and recommends putting a foot down gossip from the well has it that if you give in to them they'll take the very dinner off the table when it comes to that point i shall certainly stamp hard but in the meantime i let things slide i suspect mrs lorimer of being too much engrossed in herself to trouble about such a detail as providing meals for her spouse without my aid he would probably have eaten his pancakes without any lemons and feasted on dry bread by a smouldering fire i like myself in the role of an unknown benefactor number nineteen who lives directly overhead does not borrow my food or hire my services but she does something far worse whenever i dare to poke a fire or play on the piano or shut a window or let a door bang as any ordinary domestic door is bound to bang in the course of a windy day rap 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 comes a premonitory knocking on the floor as if to say inconsiderate and selfish worm how dare you attend to your own comfort at the expense of your neighbour's overhead have the goodness to be quiet at once it's awfully unfair because when they stoke their anthracite stoves or throw their boots on the floor at one a m over my sleeping head i could only retaliate by climbing to the top of my wardrobe and knocking the whitewash off my own ceiling such are the ironies of life for the tenants of basement flats besides the shoe dropping i am often kept awake at night by the sound of angry voices i sadly fear that mr and mrs nineteen do not live together in the peace and harmony which could be desired subjects of dissension seem generally to arise about ten p m and thereafter deep masculine growls and shrill feminine yaps alternate until the small hours on these occasions i make up my mind never never to marry especially a bad-tempered man especially one bad-tempered man but of course that question was settled long ago hurrah i am getting on a most exciting thing has happened the manners know mr thorold and last night when i was sitting with them after dinner by request he came in to call and we were introduced he is a delicate weary to death and wish i were out of it looking man but when he smiles or gets interested his face lights up and he is handsome and interesting he looked profoundly bored at finding me installed by the fire but thawed later on and asked my advice on various domestic problems which lie heavily on his soul my housekeeper has such sensitive feelings if i find fault or even mildly suggest an improvement she collapses into tears and the the children have a poor time of it for the rest of the day sometimes i think i must send her away but i might get some one worse and i am busy in the city and have no time to look round i did not feel capable of giving advice on this subject but said soothingly i wish you would allow the little girls to come to tea with me sometimes i've seen them coming in and out and have longed to know them i'm fond of children and mrs manners will tell you that i can be trusted his face lit up he actually beamed it is good of you that get so few changes it would be the greatest treat if i may i'll bring them myself next saturday shades of aunt eliza for a moment i felt quite guilty then i raised my eyes to the chippendale mirror hanging on the opposite wall and beheld the deuce figure of miss harding with a paisley shawl draped over her black silk shoulders and i breathed again and said primly that i should be very pleased and were the dear little ones allowed currants or were they limited to plain sponge cake he said impatiently oh poor kitties anything you like if they're ill afterwards it's worth it i'm afraid i'm not much of a disciplinarian miss harding life takes that role out of one's hands let them be happy that's what i ask his face puckered he looked so sad so helpless so baffled poor big helpless thing that my heart just ached for him aunt eliza was right 
evelyn wastneys is not a suitable person to play good fairy to good-looking widowers if this one looked particularly helpless and harassed for an hour at a stretch and then asked her to marry him on tuesday week she would not have the strength of mind to say no however much she dreaded the prospect as he is a susceptible appealing type of a man and tired to death of that housekeeper and evelyn has she really has a way with her it would probably have come to that in the end but evelyn harding may serenely do her best she will never be put to the test the little girls are called winifred and marion they have long pale faces long fair hair and charming dark-lashed eyes winifred looks delicate and has an insinuating little lisp marion when amused has a deep fat chuckle which makes one long to hug her on the spot they are badly dressed badly shod their stockings lie in wrinkles all the way up but they look thorough little ladies despite it all and behave as such they came to tea on saturday and we had hot scones and jam sandwiches and cake and biscuits and a box of crackers containing gorgeous rings and brooches and tie pins and bracelets and of the whole party i honestly believe father enjoyed himself the most he had four cups of tea and ate steadily from every plate and we all played games together afterwards in the most happy domestic fashion quite evidently he is a home lover a man whose deepest interests will always centre round his own fireside poor little dead wife it seems sad that she should be taken away while unhappy women like mrs nineteen live on and on if the issues of life and death were in mortal hands how differently we should arrange things i know at this moment half a dozen weary old creatures whose lives are no pleasure to themselves or to any one else but they live on while the young and the happy fall by the way oh how many mysteries there are around us how wonderful how absorbingly interesting it will be when the time comes to hear the explanation of all that seems so tangled to our present understanding when i realize how uncertain life is i am all in a tingle to be up and doing to make myself of real real use while i am still here a married woman has her work cut out to make a home a real happy home is as big an achievement as any one can wish but when one is single and lonely pause to shed a few self-pitying tears pause to wonder if it might not be better to make a man happy rather than to live alone even if one were not really in love pause to decide certainly not don't be weak-minded a grave injustice to him as well as to yourself pause to dream of charmian and kathy and feel lone and lorn because they don't write grand decision always to be kind and considerate to write regularly to lonely friends never to wax cross or impatient neglect a duty nor fail to render a service to devote special attention and lavish special sympathy on spinsters in basement flats the orphan came into the room just as i was in the full flush of my resolutions i snapped her head off and found fault for five minutes on end she departed in tears three weeks have passed by i have written to charmian a letter full of love and without one complaining word i have written to kathy taking an interest in all the details of her new life i have written to delphine dropping words in season i have worked hard for the red cross classes i have wheeled out the small manners and dispensed various teas to winifred and marion thorold i have met their father several times at the manor's flat and have likewise lo it be spoken received two evening calls from him in my own domain he says it is such a comfort to find a kind motherly woman with whom to talk over his difficulties he hesitates to trouble mrs manners who is already overworked 
winifred holds one shoulder a little higher than the other does that mean anything wrong with the spine ought she to lie down flat billy the curly two-year-old is always catching cold do i think his perambulator gets damp in the basement storeroom the grocer's bill was nineteen shillings last week in my girl's time i love to hear him say my girl it was never above thirteen miss brown the housekeeper is hinting that she needs a holiday it would be a relief to be rid of her but who would take charge while she was away why not make it a general holiday lend me the little girls farm out the babies to relations throw off responsibilities and have a real laze yourself you know you would love it i said haven't you a man friend who would take you away oh rather the best of fellows we were boys together he's had a stiff time too so he understands miss harding what a brick you are will you really take the girls i say his face lit up with the boyish smile it would be a chance to buy them some clothes would you do it miss brown has no taste it's been one of my trials my girl was so dainty a pretty hat a piece and a frock and stockings to match that wouldn't break the bank would it do you think five pounds i waved a protesting hand heaps heaps leave it to me i'll make them as pretty as pictures when oh when i was young i was fond of dress i was considered to have good taste he smiled at me in the kind forbearing manner in which people do smile at elderly women who exploit their own youth and said vaguely yes i'm sure i'm quite sure well i must be off thank you for all your kindness he departed but the very next night the maid brought a message to ask if miss harding had a thermometer if so would she be so very kind as to take billy's temperature as he seemed restless and feverish i draped myself in the paisley shawl in which i flatter myself i look my plainest and most ancient ran upstairs and was shown into billy's bedroom he was sitting up in his cot looking so pretty with his dishevelled golden curls his big bright eyes and the fever flush on his cheeks i guessed a hundred and two at sight but it was worse than that close on a hundred and three i gave the thermometer the professional shake looking as i felt pretty serious and troubled whereupon miss brown took alarm at once being evidently the useful kind of woman who loses her head in illness is he going to be ill i don't understand poultices and fomentations couldn't take the responsibility as things are there is more work than i can get through i hope you will tell mr thorold that if billy is going to be ill it is absolutely necessary to have help i calmed her and went into the dining-room to report the air was full of smoke and mr thorold was sitting at one side of the fireplace talking to another man who was facing him from another big leather chair they both sprang up at my entrance and mr thorold said this is my friend mr hallett of whom i spoke to you lately we are discussing the possibility of a short trip edgar this is miss harding a very kind neighbour she has come up on an errand of mercy to see one of the babies who is a bit off colour how do you find the small man miss harding he was not a bit anxious in the interest of the talk with an old friend the baby ailment had faded from his mind i hated to bring the shadow to his face but it had to be done billy has a high temperature mr thorold i think a doctor ought to see him he looked shocked incredulous tonight wouldn't tomorrow morning i should advise you to see him tonight it may be nothing but a feverish cold but it is half the battle to start treatment in time he is nearly a hundred and three i will telephone at once he said shortly and marched out of the room the tenants of heath mansions do not as a rule run to the extravagance of possessing a private telephone but down in the basement there is a species of ice cupboard where in surroundings of abject dreariness we deposit our pence and shout messages to the entertainment and enlightenment of the maids at well windows mr thorold was bound for this haunt and the nice mr hallett and i sat down to entertain one another during his absence 
he is nice i liked him the moment i saw him and i went on liking him more and more he is a big powerfully built man but his face is thin the fine moulding of the bones showing distinctly beneath their slight covering the clean line of his jaw is a joy to behold his eyes are dark and unusually deep-set i would say cavernous if i had not had a particular dislike to the word he has large expressive hands and a low-pitched unusually deliberate way of talking i hope the youngster is not going to develop anything serious i hope not he's a dear little fellow it is so sad to see a child ill it is but frankly he said with a slow grave glance i was thinking more of my friend he has had more than his share of trouble and another spell of anxiety would be hard luck it's a big strain on a man to play father and mother to a growing family there is one thing which would be harder to have no growing family to look after and to take his mind off himself he looked at me sharply and as sharply looked away i had a lightning impression that i had touched a tender spot but it passed the next moment at sound of the perfectly calm perfectly controlled voice you think that is so i should be glad to agree but frank has lost an ideal companion i did not imagine that such young children could fill the gap in a sense they never can but they fill so many smaller gaps that it is impossible to think of the big one all the time if you had any idea what it is to live in a flat this size with five small children tumbling over each other all day long laughing and quarrelling and getting into mischief on every conceivable occasion behaving like perfect little fiends one hour and angels straight from heaven the next well you would realize that there isn't much time left over to sit down and nurse a private woe he smiled he smiles as the scotch say with difficulty the lines of his face are all set for gravity and reserve that is so but at night after such a tornado the solitary evenings must seem lonelier than ever i don't imagine there is much time for reflection there's generally some work to keep him going rupert has a weakness for dropping things down the sinks last week for a change he drove a nail into a gas pipe and there are the bills to pay and new things to order and endless notes of inquiry and arrangements to be written his evenings are well filled up i see you are a believer in counter irritants the deep-set eyes rested on me with a speculative glance a practical unimaginative woman who has neither understanding nor sympathy for romance that was obviously the verdict if he only knew if he only knew presently mr thorold came back and said the doctor would come round almost at once would i be so very good as to stay to hear his verdict miss brown was not much use in cases of illness she lost her head the trouble to me seems to be that she has lost her heart if she ever had one to lose the doctor said that billy had bronchitis and that his lungs were not quite clear some one must sit up with him keep a bronchitis kettle going and see that he did not kick off the clothes his temperature must be taken at certain hours a great deal might depend upon the next few hours he was afraid it might be difficult to get in a nurse before morning was there any one who could miss brown promptly put herself out of the running so what was there left for me to do but modestly to confess that i had passed two red cross examinations could flick a thermometer with the best and baffle the tricks of the most obstinate bronchitis kettle that ever overbalanced itself or spat hot water instead of steam the three men stood round looking at me with big grateful eyes and though i was honestly sorry about billy deep down at the bottom of my heart i glowed this was in very deed being of use here was real work lying ready at my hand end of chapter seventeen
Chapter Eighteen of the Lady of the Basement Flat by Mrs. George D. Horn Vasey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A struggle for a life. Billy has been desperately ill for three weeks. He has lain at the point of death, his little life hanging by a thread. Two trained nurses have been in attendance, and a third unofficial one in the person of old Miss Harding winifred and marion are living in my flat bridget looks after them and does our own housekeeping and also supplements miss brown's efforts which are to put it mildly inadequate for the occasion she does not seem to realize that when people are torn with anxiety they don't appreciate boiled mutton that when they sit up half the night waiting in sickening suspense to hear the next temperature a hot cup of chocolate can be more precious than rubies therefore bridget and i manufacture dainties and carry them upstairs to supplement the supplies for the first few days the illness took a normal course and anxiety though real was not acute but on the fourth day strength failed noticeably and oxygen was ordered to help the clogged lungs to work at first it was given every two hours then hourly then every half hour and every woman who knows anything about nursing understands what that means plus doses of brandy struggles to pour as much milk as possible down an unwilling throat and a constant taking of pulse and temperature to say nothing of hypodermic injections at those awful moments when there seems to be no pulse to feel it means that no one woman be she ever so competent can keep up the fight single-handed for twelve hours at a stretch and that an understudy to work under her may mean the very turning of the scale i have been understudy by night and proud i am to record that nurse proclaims me unusually handy for a member of the laity hour after hour we have fought together for the little darling's life while he lay unconscious against the piled cushions a waxen image unrecognizable as the bonny curly-headed billy we had loved we racked our brains to think of new means and new contrivances to fight the ever-increasing danger with the aid of screens and a sheet we contrived a tent over his cot through a hole in which the elongated cardboard funnel of the steam kettle could enter and give increased relief to the breathing we made mustard poultices with white of egg instead of water to save needless irritation of the skin we used the french expedient of putting quinine pads under the armpits to reduce the terrible temperature nurse was indefatigable a miracle of energy and resource but through all her anxiety and tenderness for the little patient it was impossible not to recognize the keen professional zest in a good case give me a bad pneumonia and i'm happy said she frankly and she meant what she said at those rare intervals when billy fell into a fitful sleep i used to steal out of the room and pay a visit to the dining-room where on two armchairs on opposite sides of the fire the poor father and his friend sat drearily smoking and waiting until the small hours of the morning it was useless to tell mr thorold to go to bed his wife had breathed her last at two o'clock in the morning and he was possessed by a dread that billy would do the same at three or thereabouts he might be persuaded to move but until then it was but a waste of breath to ask it poor fellow to have his old friend by his side was the best comfort that was left but how he must have missed his wife and how endlessly breathlessly long the hours must have seemed sitting with folded hands with nothing to do but wait even i an outsider was oppressed by the difference in the atmosphere of the two rooms in the sick-room there was suffering indeed but there was also a constant earnest fight here the heavy smoke-filled air seemed to breathe of despair on those midnight visits the first thing i did after giving my report was to open the window and the second to make a jug of chocolate beating the powder in the milk till it foamed in tempting continental fashion the men shivered and protested 
they were in a draught they were not hungry they wanted neither chocolate nor sandwiches but i went on with my preparations in an elderly persistent fashion and said if they didn't well i did and i hoped they would not grudge me a little refreshment in the midst of my labours by the time that the little meal was prepared the smoke had cleared away and left a little air to breathe so then i made a favour of shutting the window and poking the fire and we would sit down together and it was wonderful how much we could eat if aunt eliza could have seen me then what oh what would she have said how i blessed the grey wig and the spectacles and the few deft disfiguring touches which made my presence so easy and comfortable not only for myself but for those two poor sad helpless young men however much one may rail against convention it remains an unalterable fact that youth and good looks are not the best qualification for indiscriminate work among one's fellow-creatures i must remember this fact when i grow really old and apply it as balm to my wounded vanity over the chocolate and sandwiches we would talk not about billy if possible and i learned that the two men had first met at harrow had then been separated for many years and had renewed the old friendship during the last two years there is evidently a strong sympathy between them a sympathy of suffering i think for with all his charm it is evident that mr hallett is not a happy man he says little about himself but i gather that he travels a great deal that he writes for various reviews and that to say the least of it he is not overburdened with wealth he never mentions any belongings and is evidently unmarried i wonder why for he is certainly unusually attractive sometimes when we have been sitting talking together i have been so conscious of this attraction that i have had quite a violent longing to be evelyn wastneys once more and to meet him so to speak on his own ground he is most nice to me oh most nice he thinks me a kind sensible generous old dear says i deserve a victoria cross and that no block of mansions is complete without me one night he asked me smilingly if i would come and nurse him if he were ill another time he said he could almost find it in his heart to wish that my money would disappear so that he could engage me as a permanent housekeeper then mr thorold interrupted and said that the first claim was his and that if my services were to be bought no other man should have them unless over his own dead body they argued jestingly while i blushed a hot overwhelming blush and seeing it they paused looking mystified and distressed and abruptly changed the conversation did they think me ridiculous and a prude or did that blush for the moment obliterate the sham signs of age and show them for the moment the face of a girl i should like to know but probably i never shall for four long weeks billy's life hung in the balance for after the pneumonia crisis was passed unconsciousness continued and the terrible word meningitis was whispered from lip to lip there were the heart-breaking days to be lived through when the terror was no longer that he might die but that he might live deprived of speech of hearing possibly of reason itself never while i live shall i forget those days but looking back i can realize that they've taught me one great lesson branded it on the heart and brain so that i can never never forget the lesson is that death is not the last and worst enemy which we are so apt to think it when our dear ones are in its grasp oh there were hours of darkness in which death seemed to us a lovely and beautiful thing when we blamed ourselves for shrinking from the wrench of giving back a little child into god's tender care who could compare a darkened life on earth with the perfected powers the unimaginable glories of eternity there were times when our prayers were reversed and we asked god to take billy home but he lived he spoke he opened his dark eyes and smiled upon us he demanded a battered boy's stout doll and hugged it to his pneumonia jacket he drank his milk and said more 
he grew cross and fractious a oh, welcoming gladdening sign and said do away no more daddies no more nurseys don't want nobodies boo hoo hoo and we went and wept for gladness illness the really critical touch-and-go illness which nurses call a good case turns a home into an isolation camp the outer world retreats to an immeasurable distance and the watchers stare out of the windows and behold with stupefaction hard-hearted men and women walking abroad on two legs with hats on their heads and umbrellas in their hands talking and laughing and pursuing their petty avocations not in the least affected by the fact that the temperature had again soared up to a hundred and four and the doctor spoke gravely about heart strain it seems inconceivable that human creatures living a few yards away are actually going to parties and attending theatres trying on new clothes and worrying about cracked cups it was with much the same shock of incredulity that on descending to my flat one afternoon i was met with the news that a gentleman was in the drawing-room waiting to see me bridget was out walking with the little girls and the orphan as usual had opened the door i demanded to be told all about it upon which she inhaled a deep breath and set forth her tale after the manner of a witness in the police court he says to me is miss harding at home i says yes sir she's at home but she's out at the moment nursing a little boy upstairs he says to me is miss evelyn wastney's at home i says she don't live here sir there has some letters come he says when will miss harding be in i says she generally gives us a look as it might be about six before the young lady settles into bed then i'll wait he says takes off his hat and walked in i said what name shall i say please he said it doesn't matter about my name she doesn't know it i stood silent digesting the news what sort of gentleman is he what does he look like the orphan considered silently chewing the cud he looks she opined deliberately as if he could give you what for at that without one second's pause i scuttled into my own room and locked the door behind me i would have locked and double locked it as heroines of fiction do on such occasions but it has always remained a mystery to me how they managed to do it that being done i fell into a chair and breathlessly confronted the worst it was the squire i knew it without a doubt if the orphan had devoted an hour to her description she could not have been more apt in some mysterious way he had tracked me to my lair i might have known he would do it he was not the sort of man to be daunted by a closed door he would put out the whole of his big indomitable force till by hook or by crook it flew open and the secret was revealed mercifully however it was so far only miss harding whom he had discovered evelyn wastney still eluded his grasp and if i could summon enough nerve and courage to carry through one final interview all might yet be well it was useless to say i would not see him he would simply wait until i did the only result would be to arouse his suspicions i rose slowly and confronted myself in the glass the disguise was good but was it good enough i hastily opened my make-up case and accentuated the lines which the expert had shown were most telling the curve of the upper lip the kink in the eyebrow the long wrinkle from nose to chin i wrapped my paisley scarf round my shoulders took my courage in both hands and opened the door i decided to go into the dining-room draw the casement curtains seat myself with my back to the light and send the orphan to summon him to my presence i was nervous and scared but let me confess it the moment was not without a fearful joy my heart was beating with quick excited throbs it was the oddest most inexplicable thing but i really wanted to see him if a wish could have spirited him away i could not have brought myself to breathe it it seemed suddenly as if 
unknown to myself i had missed him been missing him for a long long time the door opened and he came in end of chapter eighteen Chapter Nineteen of *The Lady of the Basement Flat* by Mrs. George D. Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A double excitement. He wore a dark suit and carried a silk hat in his hand. The conventional dress made a great difference in his appearance. It always does when one is accustomed to see a man in the easy becoming garb of the country he looked older more imposing in the dim light it seemed to me that he was thinner too had lost some of his deep tan i rose from my chair and bowed he bowed too and said miss harding i believe long might he believe it i waved him to a chair and said suavely pray sit down i um i called to ask if you would be kind enough to give me miss wastney's address i believe her letters are sent to this address may i ask who gave you that information i am sorry but i am not at liberty to say it was a discovery which has given me considerable difficulty to make excuse me mr um i stopped short with an admirable air of inquiry my name is maplestone thank you i presume mr maplestone that you are aware of miss wastney's wish to keep her address private for the moment do you consider yourself justified in acting in direct opposition to her wishes i do he said sturdily i warned her that i would do everything in my power to find her i am only sorry that i have been so long in doing it i am afraid she would not share your regret in any case i cannot take the responsibility of helping you any further you refuse to tell me where to find her i am sorry to appear discourteous mr maplestone but i have no choice he looked at me a cool casual glance and impatiently frowned there was no flicker of recognition in his look to him i was obviously a mere figurehead an obstinate elderly woman who stood as an obstacle in his path he hesitated for a moment and then said emphatically my business is imperative it is absolutely necessary to see miss wastney's i think she must decide this point madam he glared at me reproachfully you are probably not aware that i have asked miss wastney's to be my wife i was not aware mr maplestone that miss wastney's had accepted that offer she has not that is just the point if she had i should not need help but she is going to that is why i am so anxious to find her to prevent further waste of time braced against my cushions i gasped in mingled exasperation and dismay that tone of certainty impressed me against my will it required an effort to preserve an unruffled appearance i cannot give you any help mr maplestone to the best of my belief you are wrong in your expectations evelyn miss wastney's is your niece i believe i bowed mentally quoting the orphan's qualification sort of may i ask if she has confided in you told you the history of our acquaintance for one moment i hesitated then i think i may say that i know practically all that there is to tell he leaned forward suddenly rested an arm on the table and fixed me with eager eyes miss harding i want a friend i want an ally i came here to-day hoping to find one in you will you be on my side i drew back but before i had time to protest 
he hurled another crisp sharp question at my head do you love your niece the question appealed to me i answered promptly as it were mentally licking my lips i do i may say i am much attached to evelyn she has faults judicially but she is a pleasant well-meaning girl she has been unctuously very kind to me she is kind to every one he said shortly except myself of course she has faults plenty of them you could not know her without seeing that i glared outraged oh indeed if my faults are so many and so obvious why on earth does he you are very keen-sighted for a lover mr maplestone i said coldly if i were evelyn i should prefer the idealism which is usual under the circumstances but perhaps you do not pose as an ordinary lover i don't know he said shortly i don't know this is a new experience to me i can only say one thing his voice softened swelled into deep low notes she is my life she means everything the beginning and the end i shall fight on and on until she is mine miss harding coughed and twitched at her shawl and blinked at the ceiling and feebly shook her grey head <coughs> it is a pity she said weakly to make too sure in these matters force is a uh, is is out of place evelyn must decide she should not be coerced if i know her nature coercion will do no good she is inclined to obstinacy coercion would fail but love your niece is very feminine she would be unhappy alone she needs to be loved i have love to give her enough to satisfy any girl more than enough at the bottom of her heart she knows it she ran away because she was afraid left no address mr maplestone i am sorry to appear unkind but miss wastney's plans were made before she guessed your wishes that was true and hit him hard his face fell and he looked so quelled so dejected that my heart ached with remorse what foolish thing i might have said i don't know but at that moment the door burst open and winifred and marion precipitated themselves into my arms taking no notice of the strange man they proceeded to confide the adventures of their walk it was miss harding this darling miss harding that miss harding dear the other while i undid their mufflers and smoothed their hair and smiled in benevolent interest what could be a finer testimony to miss harding's verisimilitude than the blandishments of these sweet innocents for some minutes mr maplestone's presence was ignored but when i looked at him again it was to realize with surprised curiosity that his bearing had undergone a startling change his cheeks had flushed the weary lines had disappeared he looked young brisk assured nothing had happened to account for it nothing had been said bearing in the remotest sense on his affairs i had made no slip of any kind but had been laboriously elderly and restrained and yet there it was an unmistakable air of satisfaction and relief he rose held out his hand i see you are busy i won't detain you longer if you allow me i will call again mr maplestone excuse my want of hospitality but it is quite useless he retained my hand in his he spoke in a pleading voice i am a very lonely man i have no one else to whom i can speak it would be a pleasure just to see any one who belonged i will promise not to be a nuisance please let me come well i said helplessly well short of being absolutely brutal what else could i say besides it may be a pleasure to me too that same evening a letter arrived from charmion 
nothing like having all one's excitements at the same time it was good to see the deer riding again and i was in the mood when i badly needed some words of comfort i tore open the envelope hoping to find them inside this is the letter evelyn dear how is it faring with you i wonder in your grey london world while i laze beneath italian skies it is a rest to know that you understand my silence and don't need to be reminded that it does not mean forgetfulness that big heart of yours can be very patient and forbearing i have good cause to know that but i also know that no one in the world more keenly enjoys a word of love and appreciation so here's a confession for you dear read it lock it up in your heart and never never refer to it in words this is it then during these last weeks when i have been fighting the old battle of the last six years i have discovered to my surprise and let me confess it dismay that my point of view has strangely altered i still consider that i have been the victim of one of the cruelest deceptions which a woman could endure i still believe that in that first ghastly hour of discovery flight was justified and natural but well evelyn dear i have been living for months in very close intimacy with a little girl who thinks no evil and is always ready to find a good explanation for what may on the surface appear to be unkind and it has had its effect i keep asking myself in my place what would evelyn have done and the answer disturbs my sleep you are impulsive my dear and your temper is not beyond reproach if you loved deeply you would be exacting and would fiercely resent deceit you would have run away even more impetuously than i did myself but but you would not have kept up your resentment for six long years or refused the offender a right to speak if i know my evelyn before a month had passed her heart would have softened and she would be turning special pleader in his defence racking her brain for extenuating explanations and if there had been none i can imagine you evelyn shouldering your burden with a set gallant little face going back to your husband and saying to yourself am i a coward to be daunted by the failure of one little month he married me for my money very well he shall have his price i will give it to him freely and willingly but i will give him other things too companionship interest sympathy so that in time to come he shall love me for myself i am young and pretty and intelligent i can do it if i care enough to be patient and unselfish i married him for better or worse with god's help i will turn this worse into better before our lives are done oh i assure you my dear i cut a poor figure in my own eyes when i contrast my conduct with what yours would have been in my place if we had met years ago things might have gone differently but now it is too late too late for apologies and recantations that is to say for they would not be acceptable even if i could bring myself to the point of offering them this sounds as if your example had had no real effect after all but it is not so outward circumstances may remain the same but some of the inward bitterness has gone do you remember the old fairy story about the unfortunate king who had three iron bands clamped tightly round his heart it was the result of a spell of course and the only thing which could break their hold was when some mortal did some really fine and noble deed then with a great bang one of the bands broke loose and conveniently disappeared well dear little girl if your present crack-brained mission is not working out to your satisfaction if your neighbours in the mansions are unappreciative or appreciative in objectionable ways comfort yourself with the reflection that your sweet example has burst one of charmion's iron bands i think on reflection 
one might almost say two and that she daily blesses you for the relief i can't send you an address i have no idea where i'm going next but before very long you will see me again i'll burst in upon you some day with a paris hat on my head and another in my box for a pretty friend and snatch you away from your fads and fancies and carry you off to pastimes to gloat over all to myself don't have anything to say to any presumptuous man who may try to lure you away for the period of our lease you belong to me and i am not going to give you up charmian i smiled wiped a furtive tear and carefully folded up the sheet it did come for me to know that i had helped charmian i thought happily of seeing her again of all the long interesting talks we would have together incidentally i thought of our lease if we paid a penalty we could break it at three years end of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of the lady of the basement flat by mrs george de horn vesey this librivox recording is in the public domain strange conversations billy is slowly recovering he is sitting up in his cot languidly permitting himself to be adored waited upon by obsequious attendants and fed upon the fat of the land this is the period when outsiders cry gushingly to an invalid's relations how happy you must be but as a cold matter of fact they usually feel very depressed and snappy and bored this sounds thankless but it is nothing of the sort the thankfulness is all there stored up for later realization but for the moment tired nerves are in the ascendant and pay one out for the long-drawn strain relieved from acute anxiety mr thorold began to think of the cost count up doctors visits and sigh like a furnace miss brown gave notice she wasn't blind and she wasn't deaf she was aware that she was not giving satisfaction and it would be better for both parties the general servant who had been quite heroic during the time when work went on the twenty-four hours round now took to banging dishes and muttering as she left the room old miss harding having lost much sleep and spent her few leisure hours in reading aloud to her small guests exhibited a tendency to tears and self-pity mr hallett disappointed of a hoped-for holiday with his friend as companion shrugged his shoulders and inquired dismally what can you expect things always go wrong in this miserable world each man in turns paid visits to my flat and discussed his troubles at length mr thorold's were mostly financial what could he do to cut down expenses would i recommend sending the children to live in the country ridiculously cheap houses could be had if one did not mind living miles from a station he himself must of course remain in town but in a cheap boarding-house he could manage to live on very little say a hundred a year and when he took a holiday he could run down to the country it would be good for the children while it lasted i said dryly their father might live with luck for a year or eighteen months it seems hardly worth while having the expense of a removal for such a short time he sighed looked for a moment as if he were going to declare that he would be glad to be out of it then pulled himself together and said well but i must pull in somehow to pay for all these extra expenses have you anything to suggest well you might let this flat furnished for a few months in spring the porters tell me there are tenants to be found at that time odd isn't it that the season should affect welton mansions it's the lap of the waves i suppose but it seems a long way to flow i could help you to find cheap country quarters and you could fit in your own holiday at the same time and so save travelling expenses 
lazing about in a garden may not be exciting but it's the rest you need i knew a very tired man who went off for a golfing week with a friend his wife told me he took a fortnight to recover she said so to the doctor and he said of course what did you expect it would have been better if he had gone to bed he shrugged impatiently maybe it is quite true i suppose it is but when a man has only one fortnight in the year he might be allowed to enjoy it in his own way it's an idea though letting the flat thanks for the suggestion i'll speak to an agent mr hallett rested his big shoulders against my cushions and said in his low grave tones you are a woman you understand these things is there any way in which i can help it's pretty tough to see an old friend worry to death and just sit and look on but thorold's proud and it's difficult to interfere it seems a cruel thing that illness should fall so heavily upon the middle classes the rich are independent the poor have hospitals but a man in thorold's position is no sooner through with the mental torture than he is up against an army of bills it seems that billy is bound to keep his nurses for several weeks longer that's a big item in itself it was often during these last weeks i had thought to myself what a grand occupation it would be for an independent woman to train as a nurse and then give one or two doctors leave to call her in to serve without payment in cases like the present where need was great and means were small i went off into a daydream in which i saw myself in cap and apron acting as ministering angel to the suffering middle class to be roused by mr hallett's voice saying tentatively i'm a poor man but i'm alone in the world so there's no object in saving why shouldn't i settle a few of the bills for billy's illness and say nothing about it i shook my head mr thorold would find out and be furious you must help openly or not at all you have helped by keeping him company all these weeks he hitched his shoulders and made a grimace of disparagement it's a long time since my company could be called cheering i'm afraid thorold is down and out himself and he ought to have happy people about him he turned his dark eyes upon me with sudden interest like you he said emphatically like you excuse a personal remark miss harding but you seem to have an eternal flow of vitality thorold and i were talking about you last night comparing you with other women of your um, your generation he agreed that you left an extraordinary impression of youth he looked at me with wistful eyes he was a lonely man and i was a woman conveniently at hand and possessed of a feeling heart an impulse towards confidence struggled to birth in his eyes i could see it grow i suppose he began tentatively you have had an easy life in a material sense yes but i have had my trials a wave of self-pity engulfed me and quivered in my voice i have been separated by death or distance from all my relatives my best friend is abroad death or distance he repeated the words in his deep slow tones as though they had struck a note in his own heart but distance is death miss harding the worst kind of death desolation without peace thorold thinks himself broken-hearted but there are men who would envy him his clean sweet grief his sorrow is for himself alone she is at peace ah i said quickly i know what you mean when we are quite young death seems the crowning loss but there are worse things i've discovered that i realize it in those terrible days when we feared for billy's brain when you love people very much it would be a daily death to know that they were suffering he gazed gloomily into the fire 
it is extraordinary the capacity for suffering of the human heart physically we are so easily destroyed an invisible germ will do it the prick of a finger a draught of cold air but a man can live on suffering mental torture month after month year after year and his weight will hardly decrease by a pound you read of broken hearts but there are no such things hearts are invulnerable torture-proof guaranteed to endure all shocks it occurred to me that it was time that miss harding exerted her vitality and stopped this flow of repining the poor man had evidently had some tragedy in his life which had warped his outlook he needed cheering we all needed cheering proverbially the surest way of cheering yourself is to cheer other people therefore the sane and obvious way of spending his money was in providing cheer for the company i said as much and he said certainly but how it was winter time a winter's day in london holds an insuperable barrier against any possibility of enjoyment i said not at all there were heaps of things heaps of ways he said would i kindly specify one or two of the heaps i said certainly not the essence of a treat lay in its quality of surprise it was for him to think he smiled at me with whimsical amusement and cried you said that just like a girl you are a girl at heart miss harding in spite of your grey hairs what a pity you did not marry you would have given some man and some kiddies such a thundering good time i know of course that it was your own doing there must have been oh there were i cried glibly several but you couldn't you were never tempted no never at least suddenly i found that it was necessary to qualify that denial there are two things which are always tempting to a woman mr hallett love and strength every woman would be glad to have a strong loving man to take care of her if he were the right man well he sighed and rose heavily from his seat no doubt you knew best but i hope you gave him his chance we men have many sides but the best side is apt to remain hidden until some woman brings it out if he loved you you owed him something i hope you played fair and gave him his chance he turned towards the door we shook hands and he left without another word i turned back to the fire sat me down and thought ralph maplestone had demanded his chance and i had thought myself noble and brave in refusing to give it he was strong and he was loving he had asked nothing better than to take care of me would the time ever come when i was really old when i should sit by a lonely hearth and look back and regret i thought of mr hallett's voice as he spoke those last words and saw a vision of his face it is a beautiful face and i dearly love beauty what a satisfaction it would be to go through life looking at the curve of that nose and the modelling of that chin and jaw i thought of the squire's stern voice and his blunt plain-featured face always always so long as i lived i should long to take a pair of pinchers and tweak that nose into shape and nip little pieces of flesh from the neck and pad them on the hollows beneath the cheekbones suddenly i began to laugh i imagined myself doing it saw the expression in the blue startled eyes strange how plain faces can fascinate more than beautiful ones my laughter died away it is difficult to keep on laughing by oneself i was tired and had been giving out sympathy all day depression clutched me and a restless irritability at this auspicious moment the orphan knocked at the door and announced that number nineteen would be glad to speak a few words show her in i said and in she came a pretty thin little woman with a tempery eye i am sorry to intrude but you really must understand that this is too much when people live in flats it is essential that they show some consideration for their neighbours will you kindly listen to that 
i listened winifred and marion were playing at bears and chasing bridget to her death engrossed in my own thoughts i had paid no attention beyond a subconscious satisfaction that they were enjoying themselves the roars did not annoy me but they were certainly fairly loud i tendered a civil explanation it's mr thorold's little girls their brother has been dangerously ill they are staying with me is there any necessity for them to shriek at the pitch of their voices they are out for hours every day this is their playtime before they go to bed they go at seven and wake at six for the last fortnight we have been disturbed every morning my husband wishes me to say that if it goes on he will complain to the landlord i have complained before as you know but without effect ever since you came we've been annoyed i was furious whatever had happened during the last fortnight no one could have been quieter before and what about themselves i said coldly do you imagine that the landlord will be able to make children sleep beyond their usual hour certainly not but they can be kept quiet when people go to bed late she stopped short arrested by my expression stared for a moment and then concluded they naturally object to being disturbed in the morning we breakfast at nine this morning we were kept awake by quarrelling voices for over an hour i bowed politely i am sorry it is most disagreeable i have had the same experience myself but at the beginning of the night the words jumped out the moment i had said them i was sorry and when i saw her poor startled face i could have cried the slow red rose in her cheeks we stared into each other's eyes and both spoke at the same time she said oh oh can you hear i said oh i'm sorry i should not have said it forgive me i'm tired and cross after nursing upstairs i want to quarrel myself i'm sorry i'll keep the children quiet they will soon be going home please always let me know if i'm a bother i'll do everything i can she looked at me a puzzled look and mumbled cold thanks this was a case when my apparent years were against me if i had been evelyn a girl like herself we would have clasped hands and made friends as it was she distrusted the elderly woman who showed an impulsiveness foreign to her years she departed hurriedly leaving me plunged in fresh woe a nice person i am to blame a man for having a bad temper i have heard a sister woman who has the hardest lot which any woman can have in life a loveless home end of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of the Lady of the Basement Flat by Mrs. George de Horn Vesey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Mr. Maplestone is pleased. As a result of my suggestion, Mr. Hallett has taken Mr. Thorold to several concerts and, as a crowning effort, actually lured him to a weekend at Brighton. That was last week and as the day was mild and almost sunny i suggested to the little girls that we should go holiday-making on our own account and pay a visit to the zoo the proposal excited great enthusiasm and an early lunch was ordered so that we could set forth in good time so as to have a couple of hours with the animals before adjourning to a confectioner's for tea i remembered my own childhood too well to suggest returning home for the meal to drink tea out of strange cups in a strange room to have a practically unlimited choice of strange cakes this is a very orgy of bliss to anything in one figure and when the tea is followed by a drive home in a taxi satisfaction approaches delirium i remembered mr thorold's pathetic make them happy and determined that if it were in my power this should be a day to remember 
lunch was finished i dressed the little girls in their new hats and coats wriggled their fingers into new gloves saw to it that there was not a crease in their stockings nor a chink in the lacing of their boots and had just settled them on the sofa in the drawing-room to wait quietly until i rushed through my own hasty toilette when the door opened and who should walk in but ralph maplestone himself for different reasons his appearance struck consternation into the breasts of all three beholders i was naturally overcome with embarrassment as to what he had come for now the little girls were seized with a devastating fear lest his arrival should interfere with their treat they leapt to their feet and rent the air with protestations oh oh it's the same man we're going out we're going out we've got on our hats to the zoo so's miss harding she's just going to put on her hat it's our treat father's away he's having a treat and she promised she promised we could go tears sounded in the voices showed in suspicious redness round the eyes mr maplestone smiled like many grave people he has a beautiful smile he laid one big hand on the top of each little hat and swayed them gently to and fro well and why not of course you are going all good little girls go to the zoo and ride on the elephants and throw buns to the bears you are extra good little girls and so you can see something else a little bird not much bigger than a canary who can talk and say words almost as well as you can yourselves and think of the monkeys he withdrew one hand and held it out to me across the children's heads smiling and apologetic i am afraid i am looked upon as an obstacle please don't let me detain you i would not disappoint them for the world i can call another day but by this time fear had given place to gratitude and the quick affection which children show to grown-ups who understand winifred and marion leapt at his arms clung wheedled and implored you come too you come too show us the bird that talks we want you we want you to come with us miss harding wants you you do want him don't you miss harding the leap of my heart showed that i did the very suggestion had been enough to give an altogether different aspect to the expedition to invest it with a spice of adventure not to say romance which was most refreshing to a spinster living in a basement flat i fought down an inclination to laugh hoped that i conquered an inclination to blush and said primly my dears you must not be exacting mr maplestone has no doubt engagements not one he contradicted eagerly not one please let me come miss harding it would be a charity for if you turn me away i shall be at a loose end all the afternoon i'm like a fish out of water in town you should return to the country i said sternly it is wasting time to remain here the children caught at the last sentence naturally applied it to their own plans and pranced with renewed impatience yes yes you said directly after lunch put on your hat miss harding do put it on we want to see the bird he looked at me lifted his eyebrows and smiled as if to say that further protest was useless and indeed it seemed that it was there was nothing for it but to retire to my room and put on the boat-shaped hat the thick unbecoming veil and the badly cut coat which aided my outdoor disguise i looked plain to a degree nothing in the world can disfigure a woman more successfully than an unbecoming hat and a cheap black veil which imparts a dingy leaden tint to the complexion i had every reason to be satisfied with my disguise that afternoon but i wasn't not a bit i felt cross and irritated and balked we took a taxi and drove straight to the albert road entrance made our way down the steep incline under the bridge and up again towards the lion houses marion and winifred hung one on each of ralph's arms chattering in a continuous stream childlike they ignored me in the fascinations of a new friend also and this interested me very much he was charming with them hitting just the right combination of sense and nonsense 
entering into their ideas and adapting himself with an enjoyment which was obviously real not feigned i reminded myself that this was the first time i had seen him in the company of children memo every woman ought to see a man in several circumstances before she accepts him as a husband one in his own home two with his dependents with children and old people with his best friend three when he is angry four tried by the money test five flirted with by a woman prettier than herself we visited the larger animals in turns and whenever there was a seat the squire thoughtfully pressed me to sit down while the children pranced about to let off the steam of their enjoyment after a few minutes he invariably joined me and led the conversation to the same topic above the roar of the lions above the jabber of the monkeys he shouted in my ears to know if i were still obdurate wouldn't i help him why wouldn't i help him if i really loved evelyn and cared for her welfare how could i stand aside i must see surely i must see that she belonged to the essentially feminine type of women who needed a home i believe there are many women nowadays who are honestly satisfied with an independent career but she is not one she is made to love and be loved she needs a man to look after her the right kind of man i said primly i agree with your diagnosis mr maplestone but evelyn's nature makes it peculiarly essential that she should make a wise choice if her marriage was a failure she would suffer greatly no one but herself can decide who is the right man feeding hour was approaching a furious outburst of roars proclaimed the lion's knowledge of the fact mr maplestone leant his arm on the back of the seat and shouted into my ear but you know her so well she has spoken to you there could be no harm in giving me some hints some things might be altered though others could not does she think me an ugly brute his face was close to mine i looked at the blunt features the clear healthful tints and found nothing that offended my eye as i had realized in mr hallett's presence expression counts for more than mere correctness of outline i turned aside and shook my head the question of appearance does not count in that respect you have the one qualification which a woman demands which is manliness strength evelyn would care little for handsome features he sighed relief disposition then i made a bad impression at our first meeting my temper is hasty i dislike opposition but if we loved one another we should agree there would be no opposition i smiled at his innocence it's astonishing how guileless these big strong men can be i was about to undeceive him but before i had time to speak the children were back with a rush dragging at our arms and demanding to move on for the next half hour we had no private conversation but at the first chance he began once more evelyn has been accustomed to the country i could give her the life she likes if she wished it i would take a house in town for the season to a certain extent i believe in women's rights i should not interfere with her pursuits i should want her to be happy in her own way always providing that her husband was the chief consideration and came before everything else of course he cried loudly why of course what else could you expect i waved my thick dogskin gloves oh mr maplestone what's the use of arguing it all comes back to the one thing if she loved you the other things would adjust themselves without love without sympathy all would go wrong there is sympathy she may not realize it perhaps but if she thinks if you ask her to think she must acknowledge that in spite of small surface disagreements our real selves have drawn together closer and closer ask her if she feels to me as she does towards other men if there seems no difference between us 
i know she does not love me yet but if she gave me my chance i could make her no she would not need to be made you can at least tell her that mr hallett's words sounded warningly in my ears i hesitated weakly compromised yes i might go so far she shall hear what you say and judge for herself and now we have really talked enough suppose we hear your bird for a change an hour later we drove to fuller's and indulged in tea it was curiously enough the sight of one of the well-known angel cakes which recalled delphine merivale to my memory for she had shown a childlike appreciation of these dainties when they had appeared on our tea-table at pastimes poor little delphine i felt a pang of compunction when i remembered what store she had set on my friendship and how little how very little i had concerned myself about her during the last months with due caution i proceeded to seek information i hope the tenants at pastimes are well and the vicar and his wife that pretty little delphine of whom evelyn is so fond the vicar is not well been ailing all autumn but delphine is going strong quite launched out this autumn become quite a leader of fashion in our small world i felt another pang of foreboding this time and said sharply how very unsuitable are you speaking figuratively mr maplestone surely a clergyman's wife clergymen's wives differ miss harding as greatly as the wives of other members of society they are not turned out by a machine and this particular one is very young and not particularly wise apparently not in what way has she launched out oh um, he vaguely waved his hands smart clothes you know lots of em dinner parties luncheons less parish work more amusement always trotting over to the moat the present owners of the moat were rich city people who gave lavish entertainments and obviously chose their friends with a consideration of how much amusement could be counted upon in return pretty gay delphine was a valuable addition to a house party and would no doubt receive as many invitations as she cared to accept but the influence could not be good continual association with smart worldly people would of a certainty heighten her discontent and lure her into extravagance i munched my cake in gloomy silence which was not lightened by the next remark i am sorry for delphine's sake that she is away if you worry it out this development is her doing she ought to be there to put on the brake what do you mean in what possible way is evelyn to blame who spoke of blame i didn't it is natural to her to be dainty and beautiful she has the money and she has the taste what is wrong for the wife of a poor man is virtue in a rich woman even i a man who never noticed such things before found pleasure in her clothes she had one blue muslin he looked at me with dumb awed eyes surely never did a muslin gown at somewhere about a shilling a yard reap such a harvest of appreciation i shall preserve that dress in lavender and rose leaves for evermore until she came delphine had the field to herself in our little village any comparisons must have been in her favour then suddenly she found herself up against a new standard being young and um, oh, vain she evidently felt it necessary to her peace of mind to follow the leader from a spectacular point of view the effect is good spectacular indeed i was too perturbed too anxious to speak evidently delphine had been going in for an orgy of extravagance a pretty serious one too since it had attracted the attention of a mere man and some of the responsibility seemed to fall on my own shoulders i determined to write her a letter that very night and in absent-minded fashion began to compose its sentences as i poured out second cups of tea although i have not written you must not think that i have forgotten you i am leading a busy life and have little time to spare but if you should ever need me if there ever comes a time when you feel i can be of real help 
write to me through my lawyers and i could meet you in town or even run down for the day yes that would do that would open the way for confidences if she were in a mood to make them in any case i should feel more satisfied in my own mind when i had sent off the message and shown that i was to be found if needed looking up suddenly from the tea-tray i beheld ralph maplestone smiling to himself across the table with precisely the same mysterious accession of complacence that i had noticed on his first visit to the flat our eyes met and he turned aside drawing in his lips to hide the smile but the light danced in his eyes and refused to be quenched most mysterious and perplexing his moods are evidently very variable i am glad he was pleased but i should very much like to know why end of chapter twenty one